I am continuing my reading. What I'm doing in this series is to read through the entire standard works of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This consists of the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. I am reading in a chronological order of events, not according to publication or volume, so I will be skipping around a bit as I move along. So in our last video, Ben-Hadad of Syria has brought his army in to attack Israel. To attack Israel. They were defeated once. A, a unknown pro an unnamed prophet of God came and told Ahab how to defeat him. They were driven out now. They have come back a year later. And we get the rest of this story, the, the next battle. Here we have it. This is in chapter 20 of 1 Kings. We are going to pick this up starting in verse 28. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said the Lord is God of the hills, but not, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. And they pitched one over against the other seven days. And so it was that in the seventh day the battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew the Syrians and a hundred thousand footmen in one day. But the rest fled to Aphek into the city. And there, was, and there a wall fell upon twenty and seven thousand of the men that were left. And Ben-Hadad fled and came into the city into the inner chamber. So now, you might recall my video on large numbers in the Bible. And it mentions this. How did a wall fall and, sm and kill 27,000 people? Unlikely. I think, if I remember correctly, what I was reading at the time talks about it being uh, like 27 people. So that would make more sense. But it's a complete massacre. That's the, main, that's the important part. Every, everything, everybody's killed. The, the army of Assyria, the Syrian army is decimated. Ben-Hadad is hiding out in the city, the city of Aphek. Verse 31 and his servants said unto him, Behold, now we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads and go out to the king of Israel. Peradventure he will save thy life. So they girded sackcloth on their loins and put ropes on their heads and came to the king of Israel and said, Thy servant Ben-Hadad saith, I pray thee, let me live. And he said, Is he yet alive? He is my brother. Now the men did diligently observe whether anything would come from him. And did hastily catch it. And they said, Thy brother Ben-Hadad. Then he said, Go ye, bring him. Then Ben-Hadad came forth to him, and he caused him to come up into the chariot. And Ben-Hadad said unto him, The cities which my father took from thy father I will restore, and thou shalt make streets for thee in Damascus, as my father made in Samaria. Then said Ahab, I will send thee away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and sent him away. Oh, I like this. The uh, captains are all saying, look, we've heard that the, 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 the Israelites have a reputation for mercy. And in general, I think that's a good thing. You don't want to be known as a brutal, merciless person. So having a reputation for mercy is a good thing. But there is a time and a place for everything. But they come out, I like this, the, what, what, this whole thing here where it says, they did diligently observe whether anything should come from him and did hastily catch it. That, that's talking about his words. He's not throwing things at him. He's not dropping things. They send the message, saying, Ben-Hadad ben is still alive, and he'd like to come and see you. And they watch, and they, they listen carefully, because apparently Ahab, well, he, he was probably in a council with his captains, and the message was given to a, you know, they came up, they gave a message to a captain, went out, and the captain relayed the message, and they were listening for any sign that there might be mercy. And when... When Ahab calls Ben-Hadad his brother, the messenger's like, oh, good, good. There's good here. That, that, that's what we're talking about here. It's, it's a poetic way of, descri of briefly describing this interaction. But anyways, so they, they have this, they make this covenant together. Ahab and Ben-Hadad, it's all good. They, they leave with this covenant. But now, verse 35. And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. Then said he unto him, Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. Then he found another man and said, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him, so that in smiting, so that in smiting he wounded him. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with ashes upon his head. 
Now, this is just a weird one, in my opinion. This prophet, he says the sons of the prophets, he, meaning he is a, he's a younger prophet. But he goes to somebody and says, hey, smack me, hit me. He goes, I'm thinking, you're a prophet, why, am I, why should I hit you? I'm not going to do that. And it's kind of like the uh, one prophet disobeying the Lord after, you know, when he was told to deliver his message to Jeroboam and then leave without eating or drinking in the land of Israel. And then he stays, and so because of his disobedience, he was, it the same thing here. The guy disobeyed. It seems to, be, seems to be a harsh punishment, but in Israel, it's something that is almost necessary at this point because Israel is so far gone. They're, they are so rebellious against God as a nation that any kind of disobedience, just it, it's, it, can't be, it can't be tolerated. You've got to drive it home that these guys, you are in a state of rebellion. You have to start obeying God. And, but eventually you get somebody to smack him a good one, and now he's in disguise. I will say when it says ashes upon his face, alternate Hebrew in the footnote says headband over his eyes. So he's wearing a mask. Anyways, verse 39. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle, and behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be. Thyself hast decided it. And he hasted and took the ashes away from his face. And the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophet. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased, and came to Samaria. So basically this prophecy is saying, it's a, it's a weird way to deliver a prophecy. Although I have to say that they do this frequently in the Old Testament, these kind of performative prophecies where they you know, disguise themselves or perform act out the prophecy in some way it's not uncommon but he gives the situation I was told to hold on to this guy and that if I didn't I would be executed in his place and Ahab says well David, we got to enforce that and the guy takes off his disguise says you're right and God gave you Ben Hadad to be killed and since you didn't kill him God's going to kill you your life in exchange for Ben Hadad. You left him alive, you're going to have to die instead. And I like that Ben Hadad, uh, not Ben Hadad, uh, Ahab goes back to Samaria, says heavy in heart, because he knows that God is God. I mean, he knows when a prophet of God states something, it is going to happen. And so when this prophet says, now your life is in exchange for Ben Hadad's, Ahab goes knowing that that is going to be true. And so he goes heavy of heart. That is the end of chapter 20. It's a very interesting story there. Uh, we will pick this up in chapter 21. I do believe we are going to be reading just a little bit more about Ahab. Well, we're going to be reading a lot more about Ahab. But I think chapter 21 is about Ahab. And in 22, we start learning a little bit more about old Jehoshaphat down in Judah. So we will see you in those videos.